Hello, and welcome to Write Virtual Visits. I'm Anna Kaplan, Executive Director of Gradecliff in Derby, New York. And Write Virtual Visits is a monthly live event series. We're now in our third year of showcasing public write sites. Uh, we're really happy that you're tuning in live today. Uh, as always, please leave comments and questions in the chat on Facebook. We'll definitely have some time for Q&A at the end. I have to start out by thanking Forever Ready Productions for uh, their assistance, their, their in-kind support with the live streaming, live streaming of this event and all of our events in the 2022 Write Virtual Visits season. We couldn't do what we're doing without the enormous support of Allison and her team. So thank you so much, Forever Ready Productions. Today is a special edition of Write Virtual Visits with a slightly different format from past episodes for those of you that are familiar. And thank you for your patience as we had to reschedule. Um, we're using this opportunity today to discuss contemporary art installations at both Gradecliff and Taliesin West. West. I am both the host and the participating sites. We just installed an exhibition of work by sculptor Sarah Brayman at Greycliff, which I'm very excited to share with you today. And I also have Bruce Orendorf, Director of Public Engagement at the Frank Lloyd Wright Foundation, tuning in from Taliesin West in Scotts Scottsdale, Arizona. Hi, Bruce. Hi, Anna. Hi, everybody. And Bruce is going to share his experience with fine art exhibitions at Taliesin West. Um, our episode today will be more conversational than in the past, uh, and we'll be sharing media instead of streaming live for two reasons. Firstly, we have technology limitations at Greycliff and other public rights sites, and this allows us to have uh, more participation. And then secondly, um, very exciting, I will go ahead and take over. Looks like we've had some technical issues with Anna's uh, stream right now, uh, but it is an honor to be on this uh, right virtual visit. I'm coming to you from the Fellowship Dining Room at Taliesin West, which of course is Frank Lloyd Wright's winter home and desert laboratory at the base of the McDowell Mountain Range, as I look to my left, here in Scottsdale, Arizona. Uh, we have a unique space here when we talk about contemporary art and how to put it up. Uh, I do not have a temperature controlled room, a humidity controlled room as a gallery. So when we look at this new program that we've just launched, we have to take a lot of things into consideration. We are just fresh off the heels of a wildly successful Chihuly in the Desert exhibition. That ran from December of 2021 to June of 2022. And it was an exhibition that provided an opportunity for our guests and visitors to explore the inspiration of desert landscape and other natural forms through the art of Dale Chihuly and the architecture of Frank Lloyd Wright at Taliesin West. Six installations were here, wildly successful, received, uh, I tell you what, I couldn't be happier with the way that it was received. Overwhelmingly positive response in installing a contemporary art exhibit in an existing historical site. From the first time visitors to repeat visitors, staff and the board members, virtually everybody was awed about how beautiful Taliesin West looked and, and really noted that the Chihuly glass and the artwork looked like it maybe was designed exactly to always be here. Of course, it was a temporary exhibit, so we, uh, we move on. And we're moving on in this new exhibitions program that I uh, manage here into uh, our new Sacred Spaces exhibit, and we'll get into that in a little bit. But I wanted to talk, since I'm streaming from the dining room, this is the dining room of the Fellowship. So the second dining room at Taliesin West. I'll just pan here to show you a little bit. The reason I'm here is because this is what I'm gonna convert into our art gallery for three of the themes and about 17 pieces here at Taliesin West. So I'm bringing in gallery walls, and I'm bringing in a lot of, uh, uh, modern art gallery exhibition styles and forms fit into this historical place. And I can't, uh, can't wait to put this up. That show is gonna run from October 14th 
all the way to January 29th of 2023. Let me check back with my team here uh, at Greycliff and see what's going on. Uh, maybe I'll toss it to her. I think she's going to try and go without her camera. So let's see what happens here. So sorry about that, Allison. Maybe you can uh, just put up that that uh, graphic, and I'll talk over that. Thank you. Um, I I thought we had the technology down, and there's always some surprise to deal with. Uh, so um, uh, right now, as I mentioned, we have this very exciting sculpt uh, installed right now at Greycliff. Uh, the artist is Sarah Brayman, and this is a collaboration with the Buffalo AKG Art Museum, formerly the Albright, Albright Knox, uh, here in Buffalo. Uh, they are partnering with us as they are building a brand new building, and, and this right now is actually the only a Buffalo AKG Art Museum branded exhibition that's currently on view, which is very exciting. Uh, we've never done anything like this at Greycliff, um, and it's a installation of both exterior sculpture, and we have even installed 11 pieces on the interior of our main historic house. Uh, the exhibition runs through March 2023, with the two large exterior pieces remaining on view through October 2023. Um, this is an opportunity for us to allow a different type of access into our historic sites uh, by allowing for this conversation with contemporary art and Frank Lloyd Wright's architecture. Uh, it's very exciting for the artist to be able to have both bodies of work on view in the same installation, in the same exhibition. That's That has never been possible in the past. And to have these domestically scaled pieces in the context of a uh, home, uh, you know, I when I'm sharing you the footage that I will be queuing, um, you know, Allison to play very shortly. I want you to think about how uh, the experience of the art changes when it's no longer in the white cube of a gallery or museum, um, and you know how that um, conversation happens in this space of, of our historic interior. Allison, you can, you can play that video now. So um, as I mentioned, we have made the decision to install some of Sarah's pieces inside uh, our main Frank Lloyd Wright designed house here at Greycliff. And in the living room of the house, which is where we are now, we've actually allowed three of the sculptures to take the place of the furniture. In the rest of the house, the furniture lives in the context that we have, or sorry, the art lives in the context um, of Greycliff. Um, and in the, but in the living room, we've done something different here. And you can see that Sarah's sculpture, it uses found objects, familiar objects, um, you'll recognize chairs. These three sculptures all take a chair and use it and it uses it in a different way. You know, she's turning them upside down, um, making them float. Um, and essentially what's happening is that Sarah's intention is to, um, allow us to see the context of our daily life with, with a different perspective. And the hope is that You'll take that experience and you'll bring it into your daily life. You'll start to look at your furniture in a different way. Um, you'll start to look at that chair that you're sitting on, um, you know, with new eyes. She's making the mundane and everyday visible in ways that they weren't visible before. Um, something else that's happening here is, is allowing for a brand new perspective on our historic site. Um, People that, that have been in the living room many, many times are now seeing it in a very fresh way because they've never seen it with, um, you know, these foreign objects in it. And um, I'm encouraging our docents to focus on that and pay attention to uh, this new opportunity that, that, that we have. Um, this is the last bit of this short video, and I wanted to make sure to show you the living room at a different time of day. 
Um, this is one of the really unique opportunities we have when we are having the sculpture installed in um, a naturally lit place. You know, that's very uncommon um, in a museum setting, for example. And the artist was so grateful to have the opportunity to have this sort of lighting. Um, the work changes uh, with the weather and at different times of day. Um, Great Cliff, we have these incredible sunsets and the house uh, was designed by Wright to really glow. Uh, and you can get a sense of that now. And the, the sculptures have this incredible um, uh, electricity when they're, you know, in conversation um, with the house in that way at different times of day. All right, Bruce, I'm going to, I'm going to pass it back over to you now. Fair enough. Thank you so much. Uh, I love what I see there, Gray Cliff, and I think the conversations that it is bringing up uh, when we look at contemporary art into, you know, standard historical magnificent settings uh, designed by Frank Lloyd Wright, it is just the fact that it is bringing up these conversations and this nuance of, of freshness, the ability to look at it with new eyes. We are doing that same thing um, here in October with uh, a piece, an exhibition that we call Sacred Spaces. And it is gonna run from October 14th to January 29th of 2023. It is organized by the Frank Lloyd Wright Foundation in cooperation with Beth Shalom Preservation, Taliesin Preservation and the Western Pennsylvania Conservancy. This is an opportunity uh, with Sacred Spaces to look at Frank Lloyd Wright and Andrew Peleage and it expands our knowledge of Frank Lloyd Wright's architecture and really challenges our assumptions on actually what is a religious space? Again, bringing in a fresh and new idea. It features images by Phoenix-based photographer, Andrew Peelage, who has spent the last decade documenting Wright's work and also aims to photograph every remaining Wright site. The photographs that are in this exhibition highlight Wright-designed churches and synagogues from all around the country to the very well-known, magnificent Beth Shalom Synagogue in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, to the very little known surprise of the Pettit Memorial Chapel in Belvedere, Illinois. And none of these buildings that Wright designed resemble uh, what we'll call a typical sacred space, you know, with familiar layouts and symbols and heavenly inspiration. Instead, each of them expresses Wright's reverence for the divine spirit, but done through nature and the people on earth. The exhibition also has some of the historic and iconic homes and civic spaces that embody the same reverence for man and mother nature. If we can go to the first exhibit, we're going to um, talk a little bit about falling water. This is the first one. This is Mill Run, Pennsylvania, 2018. All of this exhibition is designed in eight themes. The eight themes are throughout the rooms. We have this one happen to be taking place in the garden room. We have them in Wright's office. We have the dining room, as I said before, in the Kiva. And each of them has at least one thematic setting for all of these uh, prints that are here. This one is called Of the Land, and very appropriate for this uh, wonderful, wonderful image here of falling water. Of all Wright's sacred strategies, the one that most clearly connecting human humanity and nature is with the divine was his placement of architecture within the landscape and the landscape within the architecture. The architecture, as he said, is no less weaving and a fabric than the trees are in the forest. He singled out that kinship of building to the ground as principle number one in his philosophy of organic architecture. So here in this beautiful photograph of Mill Run, Falling Water, Mill Run, Pennsylvania, he famously built Falling Water and its rising central mass atop this constructed of concrete and local quarried sandstone right on top of that waterfall, as you can see. What's unique about this photo is light is peeking through the tree canopy, literally highlighting that connection between architecture and nature and defining this as sacred. Let's go to that next slide if we could, please. Uh, this next one we have here is the First Christian Church, Nighttime, Phoenix, Arizona, 2013. And we look at this, and this is the thematic of marking the sky. Wright was really, when we talk about divine power and imposing its will from above, he didn't agree with that. He all but refused to include these type of spires, a staple of the ecclesiastical architecture that connected heaven and earth. He, he, 
didn't want them in any of his religious designs. These forms, however, do make appearances in Wright's non-religious architecture, emphatically proclaiming structures on the landscape and expressing aspiration, dynamism, and a, a reverence for non-Western tradition. We look here at the first Christian church completed after his death. It was a plan that was drawn up for a previously related project. But you, what you see here in this from Andrew Peelage is the church contains a flared central spire, 122 feet tall bell tower, shaped with unequal sides and made of over 600,000 pounds of concrete. The tower appears to erupt right from the ground, of course, underlying its connection to the earth. And now let's go to this next one, Allison, if we could, please. This is uh, the Guggenheim in New York, New York, 2019. This is called Looking Up. When we take a look at the thematic on this, it's sacred geometries. Of course, Wright was prolific in using geometry in a lot of his designs. A lot of the certain shapes derived from nature evoked the enveloping spirit of divinity. For instance, a building from the form of a triangle, which Wright preferred for its openness and structural strength, took on what he called an attitude of prayer. The Guggenheim here is filled with boundless glow because, quite frankly, of its 90-foot tall ceiling, 58 feet across, and what you're looking at is 169 pieces of glass in that skylight or the oculus, a truly spiritual structure nonetheless. The last one before we toss back to Anna is here, uh, one I'm very particularly fond of, which is our moon gate at Taliesin. The theme here is man towards nature, nature towards man. And at the core of Wright's notions of both sacred and organic architecture truly was the independence of all things, particularly nature, human beings, and the built world, which made things sacred to him. He considered the manifestations of this to be divine. He wrapped all of them together in the architecture, pulling nature inside and pulling man outward towards nature. This moon gate is a beautiful place here on campus, a porthole-shaped opening in one of Taliesin West's desert masonry walls, and it evokes the sacred shape of the moon and draws visitors towards a grassy courtyard via its framed view. I'll be back uh, in a little bit after I toss it to Anna with some more of Andrew Peelage's uh, sacred spaces. But now let's toss it back to Anna. Bruce, those images are, are beautiful. Thank you. Um, and I'm noticing the size of them also. Um, what, 29 inches by? Yeah, some are 20, 29. The biggest one is 44 by 44. Uh, so some of them actually have their own shipping crate when they come here from Taliesin, which is where yeah. the exhibition is now. So they'll definitely have a a, um, a physical presence in the space and and will be worth uh, making the trip to see the installation. Absolutely. Yeah, each piece is going to have, a, you know, the beauty about contemporary art in spaces like this is that each space, as you said earlier, takes on its own life, even throughout the changing light of the day. So mm -hmm. depending upon what space we put these in, that, that piece is going to be different than it is in any other exhibition. Yes, definitely. Great. Well, um, so I'm trying my camera again. Let's hope this works. Uh, you know, I, Bruce and I are talking about very different mediums here, uh, photography versus sculpture. Um, but, uh, you know, similar uh, avenues of new engagement with our sites. Uh, I'm going to dive into the exterior portion of the installation now at Greycliff. If you could uh, put that video on, Allison. Thank you. Um, as I mentioned, there's two exterior pieces. Um, these are meant to be entered into and physically engaged with, very different from the works on the interior. Uh, this first piece is called Sit, and it's pretty monumental. Uh, we needed a crane to get these pieces uh, on our site. And I'll share at the end of this video, there's a, there's a little bit of insight into that. Um, you're meant to actually sit in this uh, rectangular opening with a view of the house. Um, you'll notice that Sarah's using concrete and glass and steel, all materials that uh, Wright was very familiar with. And when you're on the site, 
these pieces have a very strong architectural presence. The other piece is called stay and we're approaching it here. It's on the left side of, of the house. Um, the colored glass is really interesting and, and something this, this video will not pick up on. But when you're in front of the pieces, the glass reflects uh, the surroundings. And um, again, it is affected by the, the changing sky, the changing lights. This piece in particular, these circular forms, they project light on the interior of the piece when the sun um, is in the sky at certain points of the day. This piece stay also has a bookshelf in it, uh, which we're rounding the bend, you'll be able to see. Um, visitors are invited to, to enter into the piece to browse through this library curated by Sarah Brayman. And she's essentially created this cozy uh, space for you to pause, reflect, and, um, uh, you know, uh, contemplate the setting, which includes Wright's architecture. One thing about Greycliff is that uh, we really are a, a truly excellent example of Wright's concept of organic architecture. You know, he was using rocks directly from the cliff upon which we're situated. Um, the lake is so important to his design, Lake Erie. Um, and when you're here, you, you really get a sense of that. Well, this artist, Sarah Brayman, she is, is also very interested in that relationship between um, her work and the surrounding environment. And um, one thing about this pairing is that it was, it was very thoughtful. It was very intentional. Um, and the work in, in, in conversation in the physical space um, is fascinating. And, and things happened after it was installed that we weren't expecting. Um, the light really animates the pieces, for example. Um, she uses light as a medium um, in a very similar way to, to write, actually. Um, Greycliff was designed to have very light-filled spaces. Um, he uses ribbon windows and um, ample opportunities for, for light to enter uh, into uh, the domestic spaces he's created. Um, and you know, Sarah is, is, is very aware of that. And to have these pieces installed in this setting, uh, just, um, as I mentioned, it, it, it opens up all these avenues of, of new perspective that were, were not available with the, the static installation that we had. And I do want to also let everyone know, as I mentioned, this is temporary and it gives people an opportunity to come back and visit our site over and over again. Um, we can stop the video now, Allison, and um, let's get Bruce back up on the screen. You know what I really like, Dana, is the one, it was almost right before you said stop for the second time. There is a framing that is going on mm -hmm. uh, through her work into Frank Lloyd Wright's. And Frank Lloyd Wright did that all the time. He framed for you. He told you exactly the way he wanted you to see things. So yeah, what a, what a nice synergy between that contemporary artwork and what mm -hmm. Frank Lloyd Wright has uh, wonderfully left us here. So I'll continue here. Um, you know, this contemporary art exhibit, before we, you can just leave that slide there, that's fine. I just wanted to say one thing about this. Contemporary art here allows the guest to enter into something new, as we've said. But we can't just leave it there with uh, it being sterile. We don't want you to just walk through and hear, oh, there's a photograph or there's a wonderful door structure or a cement structure. We at Talias and West are going to start to engage and provoke you to asking yourself through a series of predetermined questions, what actually is sacred? You know, in some ways in my research on this, the sacredness of this is right down to someone's own personal space. So we'll be investigating the whole myriad of what actually defines sacred and i can't wait for our visitors to come here so let's go to this next one we have falling water of the stairs and this is 2018 mill run pennsylvania by andrew peelage this is going to be taking place in our cabaret where the thematic is painting with light uh, what a perfect photo for that Wright, who rarely employed as we've said before traditional religious ornament he used light really as an artistic element alongside paint, color, and, and surface and materials. 
But more and more, he said, light seems to me to be the beautifier of the building. And I got to tell you, I think Andrew Peelage captured this one perfectly. What you're looking at is a moment in which artificial light hits the water virtually in the same fashion as the natural light does throughout the day. The next one is a civic center. This is Marin County Civic Center, Spire in San Rafael, California, 2016, Andrew Peelage. There is a marking the sky theme that we are going to play with here uh, as curated by Sam Lubell. Um, this one is from San Rafael, California. This is a 172 feet tall gold colored spire originally designed to contain radio and exhaust outlets but it infers a sense of civic glory, dramatically breaking from the complex, uh, which is overall, if you haven't seen this, it's two different sections, which is wildly horizontal across the, the rolling hills behind it. The spire's horizontal louvers temper its upward thrust and recall the shapes of both Asian pagodas and Middle Eastern minarets. And we can go to the next slide. This is back to our Taliesin uh, heritage here. This one is in Wisconsin. This is Andrew Peelage, Taliesin, Romeo and Juliet, Spring Green, Wisconsin, 2015. The 60 foot tall Romeo and Juliet Tower, it was nicknamed by uh, the folks there at the Taliesin Fellowship because of the apparent embrace of the tower and its attached windmill. This is by far the tallest feature of the hilly landscape and it was a true skyscraper in the context of its time and place. It signaled Taliesin from very, very far away. So that is the look, just a flavor. I have over 33 uh, exhibits here uh, of Andrew Pelage's photography, uh, eight different themes, and a number of different Frank Lloyd Wright rooms, including the conversion of the dining room that I'm in. So we will uh, look forward to answering some of the questions that I'm sure are coming in, but I'm going to toss it right back now to Anna, and we will bring uh, her here. There she is and we'll start to uh, see what she's up to. Bruce, I imagine it's been uh, really difficult to curate this because Andrew seems so prolific and um, these photos were taken over a span of many years. Yeah, it's over a decade. And I think uh, Sam Lubell, the curator, did a marvelous job. He's an, uh, very well known as an architect uh, curator and, uh, and a journalist. Um, so he has done a great job for all the shows. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, his first one was uh, at Best Shalom in Pennsylvania in 2021. And I think, you know, each each one is going to take on a different feel. Not all pieces are in every show. Uh, and each one's going to take on a different feel. And after it leaves here in January, it is going to what we just looked at. It is going mm -hmm. to Pennsylvania again to Falling Water. So it'll be a, a totally different show there as well. That's fantastic. Um, so before we go into q and A, I I just wanted to share uh, one last piece of the exhibition of Sarah Brayman's work at Greycliff. Um, Allison, you can share the video. This is a piece called Friend installed in what we call the fern room of our main house. It's this really special corner where Wright uh, initially had plans to have the two panes of glass meeting seamlessly. Um, ha as he was able to achieve um, about nine years later at Falling Water. Here, uh, he had to compromise uh, to save a bit of money. Uh, he ended up uh, designing this corner to accommodate standard uh, window hardware of the time, which is why it's not completely seamless. He is still breaking that, that um, cube of the room and integrating exterior with um, interior and you also have that that um, incredible interior planter here. Um, the the reason why I wanted to point this out um, is just to um, you know push this this conversation forward a little bit um, about um, how different it is to experience these works in a non traditional setting. Um, this is a piece that Sarah herself lived with in her home. It's called Friend, um, and that really is a the ideal way to experience these works, seeing them change throughout the day, um, spending real time with them. It's different than being in this sterile cube where you, um, you know, don't have that time to absorb and digest. So I, I just wanted to point that out. Um, and I, 
uh, here you can you can definitely see that um, her work is conceptually and Allison, you don't have to play it again, but um, you know, dealing with these um, an exploration of her daily life of the domestic and the mundane and and elevating found objects and materials in a way that allows us a new access into our everyday environment. Um, there's also very formal concerns related to her material selection and the play of light. She's definitely consciously referencing minimalism and sculpture and a modernist tradition. Um, so by engaging her work directly with Gray Cliff, um, it, it made sense in so many ways. And when we were approached by the Buffalo AKG Art Museum, we, we were thrilled to move this uh, collaboration forward. Um, so let's bring Bruce back on and um, start to open up to questions. Um, something I, I wanted to ask you, Bruce. Yeah. Um, so I find it really interesting that um, your position was actually, you know, created to support these new initiatives. And maybe you could explain some of that to our audience that might not know. Sure. For um, 80 plus years, Taliesin West has been a uh, winter home uh, and desert laboratory. Uh, we also had a school of architecture at one point uh, attached to it. That is no longer. Um, so now we are changing uh, and we're changing with the times, if you can say that. And we're looking at how to remain uh, vibrant and relevant and moving forward. We uh, still have a very active and prolific tours program, which I head up. And uh, that is one way, and I'm going to answer a question that I saw uh, pop up on the chat, is that is where this exhibit will live. It's part of, uh, there's no additional fee for it. It is part of our regular tour, uh, which really starts October 1st, and then the exhibition will open the 14th. But back in August, actually August 24th, so I just celebrated a year anniversary yesterday, I was brought in as the exhibitions manager um, to use my expertise and my background in taking a partnership with the Chihuly Studio and kicking off our inaugural exhibition for our long-term exhibitions program that is going on here. So we are looking at things like a signature exhibition such as the Chihuly that'll take place probably every two to three years because it does indeed take almost three to four years to plan something that big. And then we will do traveling exhibitions, temporary exhibitions. It is all going to be centered around art, architecture, and nature. So it all is going to have a, a synergistic feel to it for what Frank Lloyd Wright has espoused in not only his designs and building, but in his philosophy as well. But it's been a, a, a great challenge for me to take a look at the campus here at Taliesin West and really figure out how do I fit an art exhibition in here and how do I do it in a provocative way and make it impactful to our guests. Wonderful. Well, it's, it's really exciting. And um, I love that um, the schedule of, of these types of interventions and exhibitions is going to be continuing indefinitely. Correct. For us at Greycliff, this, as I mentioned, it's the first time we've ever done something like this. We don't have anything lined up to follow it. Um, I am going to be paying close attention to visitor reaction and future opportunities, and we certainly would love to uh, do something like this again. And I'd also love a director of public engagement, so <laughs> definitely <laughs> future vision. Um, we, we do have a question about um, how long the artist spent at Great Cliff thinking about her installations and um, whether Andrew was involved in the curation and placement of the pieces. I'll quickly answer my question um, or the question directed at Great Cliff. This project is, you know, over two years. It was over two years in the making. It's 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 a long process. The artist had ample time to consider the spaces as well as the curators. The curators, um, Andrea Alvarez and Zach Baylor from the AKG, uh, they, uh, you know, it's it, this is their vision, and um, they spent uh, a lot of time uh, visiting Greycliff. Um, you know, well before they they actually made the pairing with Sarah. Um, so that answers my question. Um, Bruce, if you want to tackle yours. Yeah, and I'll pick up what I see there. The question is, was Andrew involved in the curation and placement of the pieces for Talias and West? The answer is yes. Uh, he was involved with Sam LaBelle in the curation of all of his works. You know, this is a decade of his work and life. 
uh, that still continues. And he was involved at each of the sites. Um, the site has their own um, decision-making entities, uh, as we do here at Taliesin West. But Andrew's local here, uh, and I see him frequently and talk to him. In fact, I talked to him just a couple of days ago uh, about what we're doing here today, actually. Uh, but he's fairly instrumental. Um, he doesn't have the sole decision on all this because it is a true team and partnership as to where we place them uh, for what is best for the tour, the space, and the art as well. Wonderful. Um, is there anything else, Bruce, that you, that you wanted to uh, dig into before we close up here? Uh, yeah, I just want to say, first of all, a thank you to both you, Anna, and to Allison and to Eric and everybody that's involved and the viewers. Um, I do think contemporary art uh, is important at sites like this. I do think it's not going to be accepted by everybody. And to me, in my opinion, that's okay. That's okay. We are doing things that, uh, that challenge the way we are moving forward here, both at Taliesin West and at Greycliff, and for that matter, any other site. Uh, even non-right sites that are doing this. This is, a, this is a big move in the industry now. And I think it's vibrant and it's important. Again, acknowledged, not for everybody, uh, but uh, it is the way that we are choosing to move forward. And I'm, I'm very thrilled and happy about that. I love that comment, Bruce. And for those that are skeptical or um, you know not fully on board with it, I always encourage you to pay attention to your reaction. If you're having a, a strong reaction, even if it's not positive to uh, contemporary art, that might mean that 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 was part of the artist's intention. You know, um, contemporary art isn't always about aesthetics. It's about changing your, um, uh, your perspective on things, changing um, your thinking and allowing you to maintain that after your encounter with that piece of, of art. And um, that's what I love about art. I, I love how it, it makes things visible that, that weren't visible um, you know, before. And it's, it's really magical in that way. And it, it's not always gonna be a, a holy, um, uh, you know, it's not all sunshines and, and rainbows. No, it isn't. And you know, I, ironically, it's, it's what Wright wanted. He, uh, he wanted change, he wanted ingenuity, he wanted imagination, he wanted forward thinking. Um, he also wanted you to feel. Yep. He really wanted you to feel in his spaces. Um, and I'll just close out what I'm gonna say and, and use a phrase that I've used forever. It's not my phrase, but it's, it's very well known. And I think art is, it's important in the world because art is designed uh, to comfort the disturbed and disturb the comfortable. And I think that is what makes our world a better place. And I think we should also remember that Wright uh, was radical yeah. um, with with his work and wasn't widely uh, accepted either. Great point, Anna. Great point. All right. Well, Bruce, it's been such a pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I'm excited about this upcoming exhibition and your programming and can't wait to visit again. Excellent. And I look forward to continuing our conversations about what you're going to do next and, and working together with you on that. Thanks, Bruce. Uh, thank you everyone for tuning in today. Uh, and I just wanted to remind you, um, if you're looking to visit Taliesin West and to learn more about their upcoming exhibition program, please visit frankloydwright.org. Um, if you're, uh, hopefully you also will come out to Greycliff, experiencegreycliff.org is our website. Um, similar to what Bruce mentioned, we are definitely continuing our normal tour program. And so you can experience the art on a, a usual standard one hour or extended two hour tour. And then we also have the layer of art specific tours added to our programming, which is exciting for us to have a, a new, uh, offering. Um, and, um, Sorry, I, I wanted to remind you that our next episode is September 29th. So this is, a again, a, a different date than you may have gotten used to, but it is September 29th, and the focus will be Usonians. Uh, we'll be traveling virtually to Cedar Rock in Iowa and the Laurent House in Rockford, Illinois. And just a reminder, past episodes can be accessed at savewrite.org. Um, 
Allison will put up the, the websites. And lastly, now is the time to register for the Frank Lloyd Wright Building Conservancy's annual conference happening in person in Chicago this year, October 19th through 23rd. We highly recommend this in-person experience. You'll get to explore many of the sites that we have featured on our program. Um, and uh, the whole package is just not to be missed. Uh, there also will be the option for a virtual participation um, and more details will be coming soon on that front. Um, so thanks again and uh, we hope to see you next month. Bye for now.